Okay, so these are the basic reagents for a Wittig reaction. This is a very important type of reaction. Um, the key thing here is a carbon-phosphorus double bond. This is what's called an illide. To be more precise, this is a phosphorus illide. And here we have an illide, and we have to see how that's going to react with this. Well, again, we have to ask who's the nucleophile, because we want this to be the electrophile. You guys know who the nucleophilic atom is in the illide? Phosphorus. That might seem logical. The now, maybe the carbon or the phosphorus. Let's figure out which one it is. It helps to draw another resonance form. You need to draw another resonance form. Well, we can either move the pi bond towards the carbon, or we can move the pi bond towards the phosphorus. Which direction makes more sense? Well, you should notice something very weird about this phosphorus. This phosphorus has got five bonds. Did you notice that this phosphorus has five bonds? Of course, these are three phenyl groups. We talked about how phenyl is a benzene ring. It's attached to three benzene rings and then two bonds to carbon. So this has five bonds. Now, that's allowable because it's in the third period. You guys remember that it's allowable to have more than an octet if you're in the third period or below. So it's allowable for this phosphorus to have the five bonds. But still, if we're going to find another favored resonance form, it should be a resonance form where this has fewer bonds, where it just has an octet. So we're not going to move the electrons towards the phosphorus because then it would still be exceeding an octet. We'd like to find a resonance form where the phosphorus goes down to an octet. And it's crucial always to get the charges right. By the way, an illide, I believe, is a name for when we have this kind of separation of charges inside a molecule. This is called an illide because we have two charges, uh, opposite charges, right next to each other here. Now, both of these resonance forms have problems, so they both get weight. Um, this has problems because it has two charges, and this has problems because the phosphorus has more than an octet. Even though it's possible for phosphorus to have more than an octet, it's not jumping for joy about that. So both of these play an important role in the reactivity here. Um, so who is the nucleophilic atom here? Uh, carbon. Because it's got the negative charge over here. Usually people don't actually draw this resonance form. Usually we're going to draw this resonance form, but you need to know in the back of your mind that the reason that this carbon is nucleophilic is because there's a resonance form where it has a negative charge. Okay. So basically what we should say is this carbon phosphorus pi bond is nucleophilic. The carbon phosphorus pi bond is nucleophilic, and it's the carbon that's going to be acting like the nucleophile. So that carbon will the carbon will attack here. And where's the carbon going to get the electrons from that it uses to attack? From the pi bond. So unlike the normal case where we would put in a lone pair on the carbon, the carbon doesn't have any lone pairs. It's going to use the pi bond. By the way, we should predict up front what category is this going to be. And this just has to be memorized. It turns out this is going to be a category 3 reaction. We just need to memorize this is going to be category 3. Let's look at the handout and follow along with that. Page two. There we go. If you look at the bottom of page two, we go through the Wittig reaction. So step one is the nucleophile to attack the carbonyl carbon, breaking the pi bond to the carbonyl oxygen. Bottom of page two, Wittig reaction. Step one is for the nucleophile to attack the carbonyl carbon, breaking the pi bond to the carbonyl oxygen. notice that the phosphorus ends up with a positive charge here. Mm. Notice how the phosphorus is losing these electrons. The phosphorus is at the tail of the, is at the initial tail, so it has to end up with a positive charge. Um, and the oxygen is at the final head, so it's ending up with a negative charge. So this is a slightly more complicated. But the carbon that attacks, it only has three. Did I make a mistake? I think. Isn't that supposed to have an H? I should have had an H all along. So I messed up. I should have had that H in there all along. My previous pictures were wrong because I didn't put enough H's on there. Yeah, so they should have had an H all along. So that it is a normal neutral carbon. So that's a good catch. Now this would look like this. Okay. Now, just staring at this, what would be a logical, who would be natural to have attack whom here? 
The O minus attack the carbon with, no, the phosphorus. This has a negative charge. This has a positive charge. So it's perfectly natural to have this attack happen. Now, this has a full octet, but it's possible for phosphorus to have more than an octet. So this reaction still makes sense because phosphorus can have more than an octet. Um, so now we can show So we get a cyclic intermediate. If you're following along in the handout, we're doing the step in parentheses. I don't know why I put that in parentheses. But anyway, the carbonyl oxygen attacks the P plus. That was the next step. And now what does the handout tell us to do next? Carbonyl O leaves by attacking P a second time. Now, where's it going to get the uh, electrons from to attack this P? From its bond with the carbon. Because it's supposed to be leaving. Yeah. Remember, the handout says it should be leaving. Well, the way for it to leave is like this. We know it had to leave because we predicted we were going to do a category 3. In category 3, the carbonyl oxygen has to leave. So the oxygen is, is leaving by taking these electrons and moving over here, following along with the handout. The carbonyl oxygen leaves by attacking the phosphorus a second time. And what's happening simultaneously with that? The bond between the phosphorus and the carbon moves downward to the other, yeah. That's also, I think, laid out in the handout here. While the nucleophile attacks the carbonyl carbon a second time. Here's the nucleophile, this carbon, and where's it getting the electrons from? From this sigma bond. So this is unusual because usually nucleophiles use their lone pairs, but in most cases here, the nucleophiles are taking the electrons out of bonds. And then we can draw the product from that. I thought there was a double bond in between the oxygen and the mm -hmm. phosphorus. Well, we can see that we will be forming oh, that oh, double yeah, bond okay. here. I just drew it wrong. Because that gives us these two products. We can see the phosphorus started double bonded to this carbon, but it ended up double bonded to the oxygen. And the carbon here, carbonyl carbon, started bonded to double bonded to the oxygen and ended up double bonded to the illite carbon. So this is a way of forming carbon-carbon double bonds. This is a way of forming carbon-carbon double bonds. Okay, and this is what's called the Wittig reaction. Okay, that's a mechanism that uh, you might be tested on, so you should know how to go through it. That's laid out in the bottom of uh, page two of the handout there. Okay, so that gives us that uh, mechanism here. So what did we produce here, an alkene? Yes. Okay. All right, well, then we'll finish up with the Wittig reaction. Mm -hmm. Let's show the mechanism for this reaction. The mechanism for this reaction. Is it a reversible? I do not believe that the Wittig reaction is reversible. That is a good analysis. That's right. That's right. Since we have a carbon nucleophile here, we wouldn't expect that to be a good leaving group. <laughs>